Okay, Vivail, so we're going to take a look at the topic two free response questions uh, for group B uh, that you just finished up over the weekend. So we'll take a look at question one. So question one starts off with a student that conducted this experiment um, looking at chicken eggs. And this is very similar to what we did with the potato cores. This is actually the same type of lab. It's just instead of using potatoes, uh, they're using eggs here. And so what they did is they took raw eggs and they soaked them in vinegar so that the shells could be removed. They then placed those eggs without the shells in sucrose solutions of different concentrations. And you can see the results here. So they had, it looks like, uh, three different concentrations of sucrose. And then they had a, a zero molar solution, um, which functioned as their control group there. And you can see that in the zero molar solution, there was a positive percent change in mass. Okay. And we can see here that you know, initially they massed them, then they took their mass after they sat for a certain period of time. We saw the change in mass, but now this is the percentage change in mass. And so what we then uh, are presented with is a graph that shows us the percent change in mass compared to the molar concentration. And so we can see here what this looked like, okay? Um, and it's pretty obvious to see here that as the concentration increased, the mass decreased, okay? The eggs lost mass as they were placed in increasingly concentrated solutions. This graph shows us here um, that we have a negative and a positive range. Okay, so here's our zero right here. Okay, um, so you know we got zero, and uh, we can see that this is all negative mass loss, and this is positive mass gain, okay? So the first question says, using the data, determine the molar concentration of the chicken egg cytoplasm. So you can see my answer is 0.35 molar. Now, how did I get that? When you look at the graph, wherever this line crosses zero, that's the point where you can determine the molar concentration because that's where the eggs are in equilibrium with the surrounding environment. So if that's the equilibrium point where there's no change in mass, then you can just simply extrapolate down here to the bottom and determine that, okay, uh, that, that molarity is about somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4, okay? And so best guesstimate, 0.35. Some people said 0.32, some people said 0.36, that's fine. Um, there's a range that we're accepting, okay? We don't wanna see people put things like five or two, okay? Um, and that's the point on the graph, again, where the percent change of mass is zero. Um, and that would be the molarity of the cytoplasm. Then they want you to calculate the osmotic potential. So to do that, we're gonna plug in this number. We're gonna plug in the molarity into the negative I CRT formula, okay? So that's what we're given. And then it's negative one because we're dealing with sucrose, uh, 0.0831 and 295. Um, and so that comes out to somewhere between uh, negative eight uh, to negative 8.75, okay? Um, and that's our calculation there, okay? Oh, forgot my decimal, there we go. We gave a range again, because some people use a slightly different temperature, some people may have used 0 0.32, 0 0.36, so there's a little wiggle room there, okay? And even on the AP exam, you would be allotted a range, because they understand that there could be a range of answers in interpreting the graph. Okay, farmlands, near coastal regions, seawater's creeping in, right? Seeps into the soil. So in terms of water movement in or out of the cell, explain why seawater could decrease crop production. And they want you to mention water potential. So we know that with seawater, we're gonna get an increase in salt in the soil. That lowers the osmotic potential of the soil, and that's gonna cause water to flow out of the roots. So the plants are gonna dehydrate. Plants dehydrate, they die, or they don't do well, okay? So that's gonna lower crop production, okay? Because again, the salt going into the soil creates a lower osmotic potential, okay? All right, and then letter D talks about plants maintaining a higher concentration of ions, such as calcium, sodium, and potassium. So how do cells maintain this, right? They want you to explain how cells maintain this higher concentration of ions within the root. So as soon as you see maintaining a high concentration, you should be thinking active transport. You should be thinking, okay, um, these cells are gonna use some kind of mechanism to move ions against their gradient. And that's exactly what they do. They're using active transport. Um, and this is going to include things like a sodium potassium pump, which are moving ions against their concentration gradient using ATP. Okay. So what's the prediction on the movement of water? Well, you have more ions 
inside the roots to higher concentration. A higher concentration means a lower osmotic potential. Which way will the water flow? That's right, it's going to flow into the root. It's going to go down the gradient, down its potential. The idea is that water wants to dilute what's inside the roots. And so plants will actively transport these minerals into the roots to create a lower osmotic potential so they can absorb water from the surrounding environment. Okay, so that's how plants are able to pull water into the roots. They create this difference in concentration across the membrane so that they're much more concentrated on the inside compared to the outside. Okay, and again, it's done by active transport. Okay, um, let's take a look at question two. Question two came off of uh, an old AP test uh, last year's. And they give you these two scenarios, and they showed you the changes in the morning glory petal cells during flower opening. So when they're buds, the flowers are red. And they noticed that when they did this experiment, um, it changes from red to blue, um, and that the, swell, the cells of the petal are going to swell during flower opening. Um, so the pigment heavenly blue anthocyanin is found in the vacuole of the petal cells, and it's determined by pH in the vacuole. Okay. So they're asking you for letter A, what is the cellular component in the model that is responsible for the increase in the pH of the vacuole during flower opening? Okay, so if you look at this, it's pretty clear that the change in pH is the result of this transport protein, right? this potassium hydrogen transport protein. Because if you notice what's happening, hydrogen is leaving the cell. Okay. So what that does is it lowers the concentration of hydrogen ions in the vacuole, which means the pH goes up. Okay, So its role is to reduce the amount of hydrogen ions because hydrogen ions are being pulled out and potassium is being pushed in. Okay, <clears throat> A researcher claims that the activation of this transport protein causes the vacuole to swell with water. Why does that happen? So when you look at this, you see this potassium going in. Initially, there wasn't, there's really no potassium in the vacuole. But once this mechanism kicks in, we see potassium gets pumped in here, okay? And then from here in the cytoplasm, it gets moved into the vacuole. And as the vacuole fills with potassium, water is going to flow in, right? Why is that happening? Because water is moving down its gradient. Okay, we're creating more hypertonic solution in there. Okay, it's more concentrated. There are more ions in there, and so the water is going to move into that vacuole. Okay, and then the last question asks you to predict the effect of a mutation in the potassium channel on flower color and justify your response. <coughs> Excuse me. So if that potassium channel, if this channel didn't work, potassium wouldn't move in. Without potassium being uh, moving in here, it can't get pumped across the membrane into the vacuole. Okay, so in doing that, you're not allowing hydrogen to come back out. Okay, this transport protein needs a potassium gradient in order for you to have the movement of hydrogen and potassium across that membrane. If potassium is not available, you can't move hydrogen out into the cytoplasm. So as a result, the pH wouldn't change. So it would remain acidic and the flowers would remain red. Okay, and that's it. Um, again, if there's still a few things that you're not sure of, please reach out to us. We want to make sure you guys understand these. And again, the way we formatted this, this is what your AP exam will look like. You'll have one large question like we just gave to you and another one like this, um, which again should have taken you about 10 minutes to work on. Um, and the other question should have been about 20 to 25 minutes. Okay, all total, you've got 45 minutes to complete the exam. Um, and you'll have roughly 20, 25 minutes to do question one, five minutes for your response to be uploaded, which is going to be pretty simple because you're just typing it in. Uh, there are no diagrams, no graphs. And then this type of question, again, should take you about 10 minutes. Okay, that's it. Um, again, keep looking at the videos we send you guys, uh, if you have questions, please reach out to us. We want to help you guys. So please don't be afraid. Ask us questions. We're here for you. Okay. That's it. See you soon. Bye.